Let's have a round of applause for Rick. Say about 
not so much recently, but they're there. Uh, this is an interesting thing that John Resig actually made in 2007. This is the world of ECMAScript. So if you guys were like, oh, there's ECMAScript and I write JavaScript. What you didn't realize was that there is this whole insane ecosystem that all comes back to the ECMAScript standard. Um, I'm not going to leave it up for very long because it's actually awful to look at. Uh, but this is not, like, you can, if you're following along, you can find that it's uh, on John's, John.org's old blog a long time ago. Uh, so real quick, everybody knows the story, Brennan Knight wrote a language in 10 days, it's sort of true. Uh, he wrote like the idea of the language in 10 days um, in 1995, and then there was a reference implementation in, in Netscape. Uh, and in order for it to actually be adopted by other browsers, they needed to have a standard. So a guy, Steele, wrote um, ECMAScript 1, which was published in 1997, right? A year later for uh, ISO and IEC 162, um, Compatibility it was just an editorial release, nothing very interesting. Uh, not until ECMAScript 3, yeah, no kidding. There was no regular expressions or string methods or trying to catch or function expressions. Can you imagine life without a function expression? Really? No, seriously, right now, just tell me. You're like, yeah, I use it every day. Right? Uh, that's what JavaScript was like. If you go back and look at uh, the, I have a book in the other room, it's Q published, it's like this thick. It's about JavaScript that was published in like 1996. It's all function declarations and variable declarations. No function expressions. No like assigning your, your function expression to a variable and passing it around. It's insane. Of course, there's also like code snippets that don't even like use var uh, binding at all. It's just like, oh, it's gonna be this in the global because it was like, you know, written a year after the language was, was published. But anyway, so obviously this was kind of a big leap, right? There's a lot of syntax going on here, brand new stuff. It scared the pants off of certain web libraries that would eventually come, come to be developed that wouldn't even use try catch. Because they're like, oh, not all browsers. Can you imagine not all browsers supporting try catch? <laughs> right? That was actually like, a reality at one point. Like, oh shit, I want to catch these errors, but I can't because it might blow up an ID. <laughs> Seriously. Um, of course, ECMAScript 4 was totally abandoned. It was, um, it was a massive departure. It was based on uh, a, a, a paper that was written by Waldemar Horwat, who currently works at Google. He was given responsibility to basically uh, the keys of the kingdom, as, it's, as it was written in a log by Brendan to take care of JavaScript while Brendan went on to make Mozilla Foundation, right? So Waldemar got to thinking, well, what if we added static typing in this, the namespaces? all kinds of crazy stuff, and we published a paper. And then the Adobe guys were like, wow, that's actually really cool, and some years went by. And this JavaScript 2 concept eventually became what would be the ECMAScript 4 draft specification. Meanwhile, there were characters such as Doug Crockford, who had been writing about JavaScript in its you know, three, ECMAScript 3 form for quite some time. So this is really powerful stuff. We don't need to make all these changes. This is crazy. So, most of you probably know the story, totally abandoned, thrown out, and they're like, let's make incremental changes. And then you had uh, ES 3.1, which just became ECMAScript 5, and then 5.1, which added a few extra bits and pieces. But all this really was was object, function, and array extension is strict mode. That's a set, and you know, the object and meta programming. So who is familiar with that? You know, the, uh, the property descriptors. And you can use them fairly regularly. I'm really actually not surprised by the lack of hands. That's okay, you will eventually. Um, <coughs> but it wasn't like ES3 when there was try catch and function expressions. It was all API, right? No backwards compatibility. Uh, I mean, unless, of course, you opted into strict mode, which, of course, would change semantics of your program. But that was uh, totally your choice if you want to, right? And for a long time, strict mode was completely non-performing. You had this extra 10 steps for every algorithm. It was like, if in strict mode, got to double check all this stuff and whatnot. Actually, I'm here to tell you today that most of those problems, those performance issues with strict mode, don't exist anymore. Give it a shot. Strict mode is actually better to write your code. I'm not going to lie to you. 
it's just a better way to be. And chances are, if you're writing reasonable code that, that you mint and that you actually pay attention to where your variables are being declared and, and what scopes you're in, and, and you don't try to like define a variable called arguments or undefined, uh, you're probably already writing strict mode code anyway, right? So why not just go all the way and, and make sure that, that your code is actually also strict mode and secure, right? <coughs> So I'm here to tell you about ECMAScript 6. You guys are like, get some goddamn good stuff, Rick. There's more, more new object APIs. There's also classes, modules, concise methods, arrow functions, rest and spread, property initializers, proxy reflect stuff, collections. And this dot, dot, dot There's a shitload more stuff on the other side of that dot, dot, dot that I'm not even going to get to today. In fact, I'm not even going to get to everything on this list. I'm just going to show you my favorite things. So, Remember I said I want you to experiment? I really actually want you to experiment because it's one of the nastiest, nastiest things that I encounter on a regular basis. It's people on Twitter being like, we don't need no standard classes, man. This shit sucks. Get out of here. They don't know anything about my day-to-day -day life. What I need to program is bullshit. I actually do know plenty about your day-to-day -day life, plenty about what you want to program like. And I'm here to tell you right now, <laughs> try it before you start talking shit on Twitter. No. Right? <laughs> Experiment. The latest Firefox has a whole bunch of this new stuff already in it. You can open up Firebug or the web console, type new set, and it will create a new set instance for you. You can use spread and rest in, in your Firefox. Chrome takes a little bit of extra tender loving care, but go to this URL. If you're following along, you've already got it. I gave you instructions for how to get to a place where you can try this stuff out in real browsers. Right? Moving on. First things first. What is the most common pattern that you encounter every day? You use this piece of code probably a thousand times in every single backbone or underscore or jQuery related piece of code that you've ever written, right? Extends or mix ins, right? What does it look like? It's uh, an empty plain object. Um, that's the first argument, probably. Second argument is this whole long list of properties and methods and shit that you want to copy to the first argument, right? <coughs> you might implement it, maybe something like this. You, you'll have like a, this each thing that you're going to end up reusing because you're smart and you like to abstract your programs into small bits and pieces of reusable code. This is actually stolen from um, <laughs> So you have this, this junk, you've got a cool uh, array case in there. Yeah, it's a regular for loop. Can you use for hmm? Can you use it? Sure, sure. How's that? Yeah. yeah. All right. And you've got this extend implementation, which is, it's got a name parameter called obj, but it's uh, got a variable arity. So that's going to be treated as this target, which is going to basically get assignments from the source parts here. That's, you know, from, uh, you know, this unnamed art parameter all the way over so you can have like as many as you want going down so I can copy like 10 different objects back 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 and the last one wins and awesome. And now I've got an options object. You do this all the time, I guarantee, right? If you ever looked at the source of jQuery, jQuery itself likes to extend itself with with new methods just to you know save keystrokes or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> we we use so much minification and number crunching these days, I guess we could we could probably get rid of all that and still Still save a lot of code. But looks familiar, right? Nod your heads. Yeah. Wake up. <coughs> Any more beers? <laughs> Any beers? No? Okay. You're familiar with this, right? Mm -hmm. So in ES5 code land, you could do something like you could get rid of the each thing and make a merge that has, you know, a set target and source arguments. And you have an extend, you know, variable arity here. So slice up the arguments, because that's not really an array. So we've got to turn it into an array by using the slice, because it has a length property. So these generic array methods, you all know this, right? They're going to see that length, and they're going to say, hey, you got numeric index properties. Awesome. I'll treat you like an array. So we get an array back. You're going to reduce them. <coughs> First item in the list will be treated as the target, and then we're going to pass this on to merge. It's not that bad, right? That's not too shabby. In the land of ES5 code, if you're writing a node, you can use this, right? But what if I told you that was a shorter way to do it? <laughs> what the hell is going on up here? This is dot 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 thing. Who's familiar with that? <laughs> All right. 
possible. I'm going to tell you what it is. So, first of all, I'm going to pick on Eric again. Eric wrote this <laughs> during the meeting uh, in September at Northeastern while we were just trying to work really hard. He was over there screwing off. <laughs> just kidding. We were both screwing off, trying to compete to write the coolest implementation, uh, <laughs> which I think might be on the next page. Um, so anyway, what we've got here is uh, I've defined one or the other. So object assign. So mix in is kind of like a newer thing. It's not guaranteed, but assign is definitely in. All this does is it takes a, a target, a source, and it copies all of the properties from the source onto the target by using assignment. But what I mean by assignment, I mean it, it will it will respect things like uh, inner HTML, right? On the left hand side, it's not going to pave over properties that are on your target. So because its first argument is uh, expected to be a target, and second argument is expected to be the source, that's the same argument order as reduces callback, so we could just call it direct like that. But how did I get this source thing? Well, that is called the rest of the rest operator is going to do away with the arguments object by giving you a real array. So that dot 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 sources means that I can pass whatever the hell I want, list of objects to this extend, all the live long day, and it's going to turn it into an array called sources. Just like that. It turns all of the arguments I pass into it into an array of arguments that isn't the arguments objects, it's just an array. So that's why I can call reduce directly from this array that I've created with the rest operator. Pretty exciting, right? So Eric, do you actually want to hop up and, and explain this real quick? Sure. Guess what? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, we were sitting in the meeting talking about object on assign, and I thought, OK, what do you normally do? You write some function foo that takes a bar, or whatever that is, and some options. But then you just don't want those options as they're passed in. You actually maybe have some defaults you have declared somewhere outside of this, and some overrides you want to make sure are always uh, the last one to win. And so like in YUI, you do something like the merge always returns an object. So defaults, options, and then overrides to make sure that these win. In underscore, you start it off with just an empty object. Um, and then do the extend, and then you get back to your options. And then um, I was playing around with it, and then in ES6, I realized <clears throat> that you could do something nice like this. And you're reducing it. This is the, the thing that the reduce will start with, this empty object. So it's similar, very similar to underscore, but just a little bit inverted syntax here. Um, and then you're just you reducing, and the function that you're reducing over is object out of sign. Um, and you know this is this is very nice. Like you can just write that. In ES6. I don't know if you can scroll down what the other stuff is. <coughs> no, no. Oh, it's fine. Uh, it's just another example. Then minus for those people, <laughs> for those of you following at home, you can check that out. Man minus. Yeah. Oh yeah, command minus. There we go. Uh, yeah. You guys so see this? If not, you can look at it on your own time. I was looking at this from the YUI perspective, like what we would do in. We could create an assign function, and then the the ES six implementation could look something easy like this, which reads really nicely. Sources reduce, use object assign over the target, so it'll apply all the sources, last one wins on the target. Um, and then what our merge would look like if we had this assigned wrapper API. But yeah, so I mean, this is you know so much nicer than the ES3 or... Uh, good God, <laughs> awful. So uh, along the way, we're, I'm, I'm, I'll have a couple of these little parts of this. So just want to recap the things that you saw that you've never seen before. Um, rest parameters, right? So that rest, whenever I pass the foo, as far as arguments, it could be any list of arguments, it's going to turn it into an array. You don't need to use the arguments object anymore. It's get out of here. It's gone. It's, you now get a real array. That is super powerful because who here even likes the arguments object? Neither do I. <laughs> Object design, which is definitely in. Uh, this was basically like I, I spent like a month <coughs> researching all of the libraries and finding finding all of like the commonalities and it's the crossroads of all basically of extend, merge, mix, in, etc. From 
all the major libraries. And this one is the one that does the like a simple source to target assignment. Now, recently on the mailing list, uh, there was discussion. It was actually, uh, I believe, Nicholas Zakis, who used to be from Yahoo. He wrote a blog post, and then Alan Works Brock noticed it and was like, why don't we also include Mixit, in which it will copy the, all of the complex descriptors from the source, right, on the target. So this will actually pave over uh, properties, but it will also allow you to copy a source that has like explicit get and set accessors. Anybody familiar with those? You know, like object defined property where you have you can like create get and set and so forth properties, or like you can actually enforce like uh, non writables and stuff like that. This one will actually copy the whole entire thing, and it'll do super rebinding. You guys did you just say super? There's no super. <laughs> so I decided that a really interesting thing that I might do was take jQuery uh, and kind of put it in a blender and shake it up and give you a simplified version of it. So this is my simplified jQuery, right? Uh, jQuery is just a constructor that takes a, accepts a selector and a context. Right and uh, doesn't you know provide a context that falls to use in the document? Uh, then we'll just say query selector all exists everywhere. We can just use it all willy nilly. Uh, pass the selector, we get a list of nodes. This totally assumes that that didn't like throw on an invalid uh, uh, selector because it would just throw. I didn't bother right, right, try catching because look, I ran out of rope. Um, <laughs> so you would then uh, loop over the nodes that were returned. Uh, Assigning them uh, to the numeric indexes onto the this object, you'd have to uh, manually set the length here. Ugh, gross. Then on the prototype, you, you know, you had the default like there, and you had this weird push stack thing that allows you to merge. This is so weird, and you had to define your own each, which is actually pointing at this other static version of each, and slice. But damn it, because. Arrays already have slice, and why can't I just use that, right? This EQ thing, which is a cool little, like, uh, it'll, it'll give you a reduced version of the collection. <coughs> First, a lot map, then you're like, map, god damn, that's already <laughs> available on arrays, right? Like, I, I'm guessing that years ago, if John could have, he would have just inherited from an array prototype, right? If you could subclass array. Prototype that because that's what node lists are. It's just arrays. It's not really an array. It's a node list. But you, can see, you can see what's going on here. Oh, we're just going to borrow that push and sort straight from an array. Wouldn't it be nice if I could just use an array? Right? It would be really nice, wouldn't it? That looks really nice. This is just a constructor like you're used to seeing in, in JavaScript. This is just all this does is creates a function. The result of that is no different than function jQuery, except it's now makes a lot more sense because it's all encapsulated. And it also comes with the added bonus of being able to correctly inherit from uh, natives. And you say, well, wait, you can borrow from array by using object create, assigning it to the you know, prototype of whatever constructor you just defined. Except what happens when you try to set the length property of that thing. It's supposed to, uh, you know, the length should then truncate the actual length of the array. So if you have like five things and you set the length to zero, <coughs> these things should go away. That actually doesn't work when you inherit <coughs> ES5 code. Well, it will in the future. <laughs> By extending, you'll actually have real length properties that are smart and will be treated correctly. But there's a whole lot of other exciting shit going on here, right? Yes, Ben? Okay, so now let's get to the other exciting things. Do you remember in the other piece of code, if you'd like me to look at it, I had to do this thing, right, where context or document, because who always provides the context argument? Everybody? No, I don't. Either. I rarely use the context argument. Always. Really? Always? No? Yeah, I didn't think so. Nobody does, right? Um, but it, somebody might want to, to speed up their selectors. Oh, why not? What have I done here? 
this look familiar? I'm sure it looks familiar. You can write code in almost every other damn language you've seen this before. <laughs> Parameter default values. Right? Yeah. So what this says is if if selector is undefined, it's going to default to uh, an empty string. But if the context is undefined, it'll default to a document. Now, if we pass explicit undefined in those positions, that will trigger the default value. So I could have a string and then, you know, a uh, second argument undefined, and it will trigger that. So it can trip that, but not with null. Right? Not, it's not like a true thief, falsy thing. Just explicit undefined or actually undefined. So predator default values, that's awesome. That's powerful shit, right? Now all of a sudden I'm not like worried about like having like five lines of parameter normalization anymore. You guys have seen that before, right? Written, you probably wrote it today. I know I did while I was picking these examples, trying to come up with Let's go, man. All right, so moving on. I don't want to make a show here of, of pointing out that the instance of actually works correctly. So you can call this without a new, right? The way you would expect jQuery to work. And in there, it, we'll know that it's supposed to be a, an instance of jQuery. So that actually does work. Uh, that's just a small side thing. So we can make sure that we test that and always return new jQuery instances because it's smart enough to know that it is. <coughs> this will work if you create an instance and go uh, blah, 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 instance of jQuery, it will say true. But it'll also say instance of array is true as well. So stay away from this, because it's not exactly always what you want. Boom. Super! Remember I said something about super rebinding? Yes, super is a real thing. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> super is a real thing in JavaScript. This special keyword is only available within the class body. See, the, uh, all the way up there, thank you. This one right here. If you try to use super <laughs> out anywhere else, it'll throw. Super is, is a, it was never reserved. Right? So it's it's uh, only contextual inside the class box. Uh, this avoid you know insane uh, historic incompatibilities, right? Because uh, there's no way that any code like this exists today for us to possibly break. So when I call super in here, what this actually does is it initializes uh, an, a brand new empty array as the, this object, which means that I can now take. Uh, so I, I added the feature where you can, you know, pass in a, a, a single node and turn it into a jQuery object or whatever. So my node type there, and then I just wrap it in, a, you know, square brackets and push that onto my brand newly initialized array instance. Or I'm going to use looks familiar, right? Looks like the rest operator. This one's called spread. And you think about it this way, I'm going to spread this thing out into an array. So that's a node list, right? Query selector all gives you a node list. The dot, dot, dot in front of it will spread it into an array, a real array. So it can then just be pushed onto the current instance that we have. Done. That's it. That's all you needed to construct your new jQuery collection. Constructor. Awesome. Which also means that you can now do things like uh, regular old slice right on jQuery. You notice something? Little, I had to implement each slice map, and we had push sort and all that stuff. But I, I didn't implement any of those here because I are, already have them. So I like to think that if, you know, six or seven years ago when John was dreaming up jQuery, he probably would have said, I'm not going to bother implementing an each because I can just <coughs> inherit from array and use the for each and call it a day. <laughs> right? Wouldn't you do that? That's what I would love to do. And I plan on doing it as soon as I possibly can. So I wanted to show you something. Check this out. Can I have a quick question? Yes, sir. This right here, uh, this is, there's a lot going on here, but would it be fair to say that ECMAScript allows us to both properly subclass array and it offers this kind of alternative syntactic sugar for prototypal inheritance? Is that what we're looking Correct. for? Correct. So you're that, 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 I'm, I'm going to repeat the question. Ben wanted me to clarify for all of you that this is just a proper syntactic sugar for a, a constructor function with a prototype definition. All these are, these methods here, these are the prototype methods that are being defined. So if you're used to doing you know, define your function there and then define the prototype following that. 
that's all been crunched down into a single convenient sugar box of sugar, right? It just makes everything uh, uh, encapsulated into a single concept. It's like, write what you mean, right? Write what you mean, not write a bunch of other things that will eventually convey what I mean uh, in this program. But I actually want to write what I mean. What I mean is I want to create a class called jQuery that has methods, right? It's far more clear to follow what is the intention is here than, say, here. Because this is a lot to digest and to look at and to understand. I'd argue that this is simple to grok. Yes? Good quick question. The yes. spreads operator that you use there, is it dependent on the object that's being returned being inherited from or being an extension of array? No. Here's the great thing. It can also be uh, an, an iterable, something that implements an iterable protocol, an iterative protocol, right? It can be anything with a length property that will spread that out into an array. Cool, right? There's another question. Yeah. Um, so if we were to try to do this using the, the current prototype system where you create like a temp constructor and wire up the prototype name, mm -hmm. that still work or do you have to use the syntax? What's the question? Yeah, clarify what you mean because it, 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 in my mind I'm thinking, why would I want to do that when I can do this? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to understand. Once I can start doing this, I'm going to do this and never ever do that again. Well, sure. But is, so it's a fundamentally different uh, data structure underlying these two things, essentially? No. Or a data model? No, it's the same thing. What the result of this is just a function constructor. It's just okay. a different way of writing. Sorry, a constructor function, right? It's, it's, it just looks different on the outside. The point is, write what you mean. Like, when you're going function, foo, and then this dot blah 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 inside, and then you go foo prototype, and spend all that time. What you're really trying to say is, I want to create a type, a, you know, this type that has, that implements this interface with these API keys. This more closely represents what you're thinking when you're writing that program than the current form. So the goal here is allow the sugar to give you a way to write what you mean instead of write a whole bunch of other stuff that eventually means what you want. Does, does legacy change? Of course. And, and yes, exactly. So the other question is, would legacy code still work? Yes, absolutely. It certainly would. Is super just calling the constructor on the class yes. to extend? Yes. Well, is, is there a danger of not calling that the first thing in your new constructor? It just won't. In it, the question is, is there a danger of not calling super? Uh, the danger is if you didn't call super, it just wouldn't initialize or the, insta the not, instance. Not calling super <coughs> first thing in your new Oh, uh, you know, I actually, Eric, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That hasn't been finalized yet, has it? The order in which super gets called. Um, so, like, yeah, if you try to assign something to this before it? Yeah, I'm not sure. I believe that the answer is, is that the jury's still out on that. The semantics have not yet been fully specified. So, interesting question. Sorry that I can't give you a definitive answer. Aside from, tune in next time. Okay. And, and so, Rick, it might be worth pointing out that, that if not this dot instance of this instance of jQuery, that like that's ES3 syntax. Oh yes, that, that good those call. Those first that, few that, lines are they right? That that that's uh, <coughs> that's available today. It has been available since 1999. It's just a way of allowing you to forget use <coughs> to use new right. and have it still work. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. <clears throat> so, real quick recap. Uh, we had a class, right, that extended from a native array, uh, parameter default values, which is very exciting. Real super, she the spread operator. This can turn node lists into an actual array, but again, like we said over here, not just the node list, it'll turn the arguments object into an array, it'll turn things that uh, implement the iterative <laughs> protocol into an array, it'll turn anything with a length property into an array. It it will work very hard to make whatever you pass it an array, which is exciting because it allows you to be very flexible, very expressive with what you write. Um, it's, a, it's a small thing with a big payoff. <coughs> Go. So the spread operator, does it return the, are the brackets uh, part of the spread operator itself? Or so, is that returning uh, an array within an array? Uh, so currently the grammar uh -huh. specifies that you need the, the the square brackets. Okay. The original proposal had uh, had a part to it where a spread would work in arguments lists without that. I found that zero implementations thus far 
support that, so I wanted to keep the code examples uh, to a place where you guys could try these out using Tracer or uh, you know, in Chrome Canary or Firefox and, and, and see it work and be successful with it. So to answer your question, when it stands alone, it has to have the square brackets in a, a parameter list. It should be able to stand without the square brackets. However, not yet implemented in any uh, runtime that I tested. Same question. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Glad I could help. Um, so, and this thing, which is sort of new, but we're going to get to it later, concise methods. Notice something interesting about these methods that we're defining in the class? Who can name it first? I'll give you a high five. Exactly. What's the point? We all know that we see the parens, we know that we're defining the function, right? This is a pretty good visual indicator. So why do we do that? We don't. So you get the concise method. I couldn't hear what he said. Uh, so no, oh, sorry. He pointed out that it doesn't say function. There is no colon and it doesn't say function. Because it's a method, this is only allowed inside of uh, the, the the grammar. Basically, put it in. It's allowed in a block, but only in the class, class body blocks and object literal block. Gotcha. Blocks, right. Cool. So I actually have a great example later on of it in just a regular old, the object literal syntax. <coughs> so this is a fairly complex example, and. I'm just going to ask you guys to stick with me. Private data. Who here has struggles with the private data problem in JavaScript? You have a piece of information that you want to hide away from. So you're writing a library or an API. You have some sort of state that you want to keep out of the, the dirty mitts of your users because you just don't. So you're like, fuck it, I'll put an underscore in front of this. Problem. They'll never touch it. They're never, never going to touch it. <laughs> They're never going to call this method. They're never going to overwrite this data. Bullshit, they will. And then they'll find it even if you don't document it and they'll exploit it. Trust me. We get bug reports for jQuery of people like filing tickets against like the underscore remove data function. Worst mistake ever putting that on the actual jQuery object. But what, what else, what other choice do we have? Because when we're defining a, a class or a type, right, and we initialize some sort of private state in the constructor, but then we want to modify that state in our prototype methods. Uh oh, how do I access that? Well, I guess I'm going to slap it on this because that's going to get shared across them. Or I can just wrap the thing in an iffy, and then I can have some state outside, sort of maybe like this. So I have this thing that I'm going to call count, which is going to it's wrapping up uh, what the uh, what exposed, what the hell is it? Revealing module pattern, I believe is what it's called. Revealing module pattern. Because it gets revealed down here. Um, so the first thing, uh, we're going to declare uh, two things. One's called accounts, the other's called ledgers. Uh, then we have this like useful helper function called get account, which takes a, an account uh, object and then it's going to uh, find the index of that account in the accounts array, and then dereference the ledgers to get you the ledger from that account. So I guess I probably should have changed that to get ledger. Right? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I, I wrote this yesterday. Give me a break. Uh, so get ledger slash get account, just to help the function. Uh, then the actual class we're defining called account it takes an initial dollar value, uh, pushes the instance that it's initializing into the accounts. Uh, and then it's going to push uh, a ledger object into the ledgers, which is an array of bots and an array of withdrawals. It's going to check to see if the initial value is not undefined. And if it isn't, take that initial value and you know, reassign it back to the initial or set it to zero. Great. Start off with our first transaction of zero dollars or, or whatever the initial value was. Everybody with me so far? Awesome. So a transaction accepts a type and an amount. And then it will do get account, sorry, get ledger, right? Using this, right, as the key that's going to get from index of, uh, and then the type. So I just figure we, we can see down here, we just map the type to deposit or withdraw. This is not a very secure class, I apologize, uh, even though it's uh, financial information. 
Uh, if we want to calculate balance, we just call it the balance method, which is so going to pull up the book. Again, we'll just pretend it says get ledger. Uh, and then it's going to, holy shit, it's going to do a reduce on all the deposits, uh, you know, starting at zero and going through the deposit records, uh, adding value. Uh, I should have renamed that to the, sorry. Um, anyway, the point is that it will, it will add up all the deposits and then it's going to uh, you know, subtract up all of the, <laughs> is, is going to take away all of the withdrawals, uh, and then it's going to do some interesting formatting, because we're saving our numbers in, in, in cents, of course, obviously. So then we're going to make it uh, some sort of human readable number, awesome, and great. So we have successfully created private data. The problem is, is that at some point in our extremely long running uh, account program that's you know, taking care of client accounts for Wall Street, then this never actually gets refreshed or shut down at the end of the night. This program runs on uh, your boss's laptop for like weeks at a time. Um, and he's constantly creating accounts and looking at other people's accounts. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, so you get, something's going on with the heap. So you go and he's like, my computer doesn't work anymore. And you come in, you're like, I swear to God, I'm, not IT, I'm actually just one of the engineers. Leave, why are you making me do this? So you dutifully open up the Chrome uh, inspector and you're like, holy shit, memory profile's gone bananas. That's because that accounts array has been holding references to every friggin' account that ever got initialized for weeks and weeks and weeks of your boss dicking around with the, the accounts app that you guys wrote. Because those references in accounts just stay in there forever. That's awful. This is an awful thing, right? It's all of a sudden the thing nose dives and he calls you and he's like, you're fired, get out! You're like, but it's your fault for not refreshing the browser every once in a while, jerk. <laughs> that your next job, you're like, fuck it, I'm gonna use a weak map. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I'm not gonna use the revealing module pattern anymore. I'm gonna use a real module. Which is awesome because inside the modules, body, that's its own scope. This is its own scope. Say it with me. Own scope. Own it's not scope. tainted by the global scope <coughs> in which it exists in, right? Does, does anybody understand the, the depth of what I'm saying? So if some jerk at Mootools has extended the array <laughs> <laughs> not in here. In here you're that's that's the global environment record that, uh, that is its own global environment record. Fresh. It's a wonderful thing. This is great. So instead of me then having to return my, my account, uh, I'm just going to export it. Oh, sorry, I skipped the line. We're going to create books, which is a new weak map. Awesome. Weak maps allow you to use objects as keys. So you can create arbitrary relationships between arbitrary objects. So you have object A is related to object B and it's held tightly within this scope. Pretty neat, right? So what's most exciting about weak maps is that if at some point the instance goes away, you know, as in your boss is like, ah, no, refresh the, the, the search results. I, I don't mean refresh the browser, it's just like, new search. And I'll look at the cats and Brad Smith's account compared to Jones's account, and then I'm gonna get rid of that, and I want a new view and make a new bar chart. And all of these things, eventually you're going to go away, right? Weak maps will mark, will, will have an internal uh, garbage collection algorithm that they basically interact with, the, with the, the runtime's garbage collection. And they'll say, aha, this isn't being referenced anymore. Release it. We're done with it. We're not going to hold on to the object that was the value side anymore because the key is no longer being referenced. At some unknown point in the future, it's not an observable change. You can't write code that eventually relies on this. Um, but what you can rely on is that when the browser itself does generational garbage collection, eventually, if that reference has gone away, as does the record. That's exciting. That's memory management that, that's fairly reasonable. And without a whole lot of like new concepts to, to accept, you just have to understand that I can use the instance as the key. Pretty exciting. So 
which you can then export to class. So that's kind of like when we did return account down here from the revealing module folder. This time we're going to export. So remember the what I was saying before? Write what I mean. See what you mean. Don't beat around the bush. What we really wanted to do on the last slide was just export the constructor from the revealing module pattern. So export the constructor from the module, right? This makes a lot of sense when you read this code out loud. My client module exports an account constructor. Instead of using a function as this, yes sir? Is, it, is this notice where you can export multiple things or is it one like return? Uh, yes, I can export. What's the question? Uh, the question was, uh, is it limited to one export or can we export multiple things? You can export as many things as you like. So, for example, if I were to uh, say, fuck the boss, I'm going to put a security hole in this thing. Yeah! <laughs> export books, and then I could, uh, then I could get books right out of the module just like that. <coughs> right? Well, we don't want to do that because we don't want to be fired. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I know. Uh, our career is really, really taking a turn for the worse. Two yes. brief questions. Like, one, uh, can you reopen a module to access books again, or is it only within the scope of that like, physical? You cannot reopen the module. Question, right? repeat, the question. repeat the question was, can you reopen a module? The answer to that question is no, you cannot reopen the module. Another one, if you didn't import account from client, could you say variate with new client dot account? Like, is there a syntax for that? Uh, that syntax is still being argued. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay so eventually. This is, the old, this is the only one that's fully agreed upon. Okay. So again, going back to, I wanted to give you guys code examples you could actually run in Tracer uh, based on agreed upon parts of the specs. But Ben was saying, can I, can, can I do uh, client dot count? Um, what, what the hell is left, dude? <laughs> oh, let let is uh, uh, you guys are familiar with it there, right? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> bar, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's strange. Because I don't know what a variable is. <laughs> I think it must be variable. <laughs> 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 Variable characters. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let let is like is, is like var, uh, except that it is block scope. This is not a very good example of it. I threw it in there, but uh, are any of you familiar with the fact that you can create blocks, real blocks in JavaScript by just having an opening and closing curly phrase? But they're fairly useless because you can't scope anything. To them. With let you can. And with also constants, you can create block scope <laughs> uh, uh, bindings inside of these formally completely useless things. Also, do you know you can label those blocks? Anybody know that? <laughs> <laughs> Technically, you can implement them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so, so real block scoping. Uh, a better example would be something like. Um, when you create a, a for <coughs> loop and you do you know, like for var i equals o and you know, do the whole like initializer and the mutator and then uh, so the comparison the mutator blah blah and then at the end you actually have this i that's in that scope now oh, that sucks because what if I have another loop in the same function that comes up var i the JS lint is like no you've done it wrong <laughs> <laughs> no you've already declared i <laughs> let will let you just let i in your first uh, for loop and then let i in your second loop and thankfully it's just scoped to the block of the that's created by the for loop. Pretty exciting. It doesn't leak out into the rest of the scope. Um, that that's probably the most obvious example. Um, uh, there, there's still some discussion about semantics of in, the initialization and assignment phases. Um, an interesting thing called the temporal dead zone has been discussed. Uh, I'll let you <laughs> that one. I'm not going to explain the temporal dead zone. 
<laughs> we'd be here all night. Um, <laughs> it is like temporal, just like temporal. Uh, temporal dead zone. Feel free to Google that. I guarantee you'll find out. Uh, so is, is the module function scope or block scope there? The the, it, it's called module scope. It's it's a global environment record all of its own inside the, inside the module. So if you do a var, is that? But you, you, a var, is that uh, you can't the leak module? out from you can't leak out from okay. a module. So if you omitted a var, you can't leak out. You shouldn't be able to leak out globally. Hmm? Oh, just ignore that. Google <laughs> <laughs> This is me trying to figure out the temporal dead zone. Um, so we've still got so much stuff. Stop interrupting me. So remember, we had the uh, again, we we were we had that whole like ternary statement where we were like, ah, if initial is undefined, or if it's not undefined, we use that value, otherwise make it zero. Well, we're just gonna use a parameter default. We're gonna just say if initial was undefined, we're gonna set it to zero, so we'll always have a, uh, a, a zero dollar deposit at the beginning, right? Books, we're going to create a new entry into the books we have with this as as the uh, as the record, right? With that, uh, with the, our, our ledger values, array of deposits and array of withdrawals, just like before. So then we're gonna call transaction, it's gonna be a deposit with the initial value. Remember, we're seeing this awesome pattern again, right? Concise methods don't have to write function all over the place. So we define transaction, which is actually very similar to our last, to our, our, our uh, ES5 implementation, right? What happened? Oh, no. No, there we go. It's, it's, it's not that far. I mean, of course, it's still probably named poorly, but you get the idea. So we get count. Not much different from doing books, get this, you know, do you reference the type, push in. Uh, a, a, a new uh, transaction record and check this. Balance, something happened here. <coughs> Why is that? You guys hear this? Holy shit. It makes sense to read now. <coughs> wait, 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 what? <laughs> Friggin', this is ugly. I have no idea what's going on. All I see, literally, all I see is reduce function, reduce function. <laughs> Then when I do this, it actually looks like a mathematical equation. Well, that's because I've used a fat arrow here. Incredible. It doesn't even require a body. It has implicit tail return. Holy shit. This is amazing. All right, so it starts with a zero value on both of them. Great. Uh, when you pass in the arguments, look, no function there. But I don't need that. It's unnecessary. We, no, we know that that's a function, right? Did you think it was going to be anything else? <laughs> if you did, you're wrong. <laughs> so great, so we throw a fat, uh, so we throw the arrow function in there. This is a fat arrow, right? Incidentally, this, we're not taking advantage of it here, but this also will bind the, the enclosing scope that it came from. Really. I'll get to that in a second. The great thing is, is I didn't have to even write a return. I just did the math that I wanted to do and let reduce get on with the job. So I'm just writing what I mean. Not just a bunch of bullshit function or term. I don't need that. I don't need to say that. I just need to get to the point, right? So what do you guys think of the F function? Tell me the truth. I think it's pretty awesome. I also think that the concise methods are really awesome as well. I think that not having to write the word function all the time is pretty awesome. How many times a day do you think you work? Let's let's take a little poll. How many times a day, on average, Tuesday, do you think you write the word function? Okay, that's good. Fifteen. Fifteen times. If, how many times? Fair enough. This is a good example. He's written it so many goddamn times in his life that he has to have a friggin' editor macro. Holy shit, ladies and gentlemen, Ben. <laughs> right? So, you can imagine how many times Ben has written the word function, right? That he has to have this, this macro. Um, but, so the whole idea is that, like, yes, the, the weird old crotchety dudes and us are listening because we don't want to write function anymore either. So, write what you mean, right? Incidentally, <coughs> these are optional. So, if I only had one argument, I would actually be able to omit those parens as well. We'll get to that. I've got an example here. Any questions? 
Again, that link right there, if you open that up in Canary Chrome, you can actually see this piece of code executing for your guys. So, oh wait, you know what? I think I missed something. Ha! I did! Import account from client. So we sort of touched on it earlier. This is part of the, the import uh, syntax binding basically exports from the client into the current scope. There is some discussion about how do you pull everything in. Now originally there used to be like an import asterisk. People were like, oh, import asterisk, that's just gonna, like, what if you have a module that exports 10,000 different things and you import asterisk and all of a sudden your scope has all 10,000 things in it. I say, well, don't do that. <laughs> but what if I have a module that exports three things and they're really useful and I just don't want to have to type them out? So there's a lot of discussion and it's still an evolving specification, of course, right? But right now, this, again, this very convenient uh, destructuring, right, is available. So I can, by name, pull out things that client exports, as I showed you earlier when I leaked all of that secure uh, financial data. Good thing my boss didn't catch me. Yes? Why do you need the braces around account? Uh, because client module, this is just an object. So in referencing from an object, you use, you indicate by using curly braces. So pull me out. So I want to do, uh, to destructure from an object. So that's the syntax that you use to pull out uh, identifiers from that object. <coughs> Uh, can you alias when you import something so I can say import account? Unfinished specification. Add. Yes, that is one of the huge arguments. Is, do, is uh, a substituting from with as. And it, do you do you recall the state of that at the last meeting? No, and it's probably going to change after that. Too. Agreed. Uh, that's what I would also guess as well. Yes, sir. Uh, ma'am, I'm sorry. I thought that was his hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Was any hand on namespacing? Uh, namespacing. Uh, the same. There is no namespacing uh, in like the, the like the like C plus plus namespacing. There is namespacing in the sense that uh, if I create this identifier, I've created it. If it existed before, bummer. I just overwrote it. Can you right. Put a module in a module. Yes, you can put modules inside of modules and export that module. So you can you can actually do export module if you like. You can put export from. <laughs> So you could create a hierarchy of, of, of modules starting from a single module. So you could, the same way you do, like just picture the way you do uh, uh, plain objects now. You're like app, right? And then you're like router. <laughs> you know, like you could do effectively the same thing. But it's still like there's no, there's no, no uh, concept of namespace <coughs> ownership, like in the C++ namespace ownership. I was uh, thinking like modulizing. OK. But, but so it's it's. It fits within the paradigms that you are in now. So, th does, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. There was a hand over here, and I'm sorry that I ignored you for a second. I, I just want to be clear that export yeah. makes uh, makes the uh, object available for import outside. Yeah, so, Correct. export does not automatically push it into the greater scope. Correct. Okay. It allows you to pull something out, but it does not just kick it out and out of the nest yeah, and just tell it to go to college and fend for itself. <laughs> um, it has to get accepted first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. If you nest modules, do they have to be in the same code file? Uh, well, Repeat the question. You can import from, so I could put an import inside the module here, inside that module body, that imported from another module file. But then that module And then I can export global, right? That module would be inside this, it would only be exported, or sorry, Anything you import from that module would only be inside this module scope. You would then have to export it from this module to then later be imported here. But there, there's, there's, so there's no risk of like accidentally, there's no PHP risk here. Sure. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's not like, um, uh, require, what is it, uh, in, what the hell is the PHP function where you just can pull in a whole other PHP <coughs> file and it doesn't matter? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it includes, right. It's, it's not, nothing similar to that. But is, is there a way to put a module inside another module such that the, the air module does not appear globally? 
but is in a different file. If you didn't want to export it from the module, like say you I have imported it to or something, and I want to be able to say like foo.util. So foo is a module, and then I have a smaller module inside of it. Oh, yeah, you just want to have a bunch of utilities that you that you only use inside your module. Well, no, maybe it's other people can use them, but I want to nest them semantically inside some other module. Because otherwise, if it, I just name it util, and then I smash the name util for every other module, right? We can bother you after. Yeah. Just yeah. Only. Uh, well, the thing is, you, you would I only be taking util inside the scope that you imported it to. Okay. We'll, we'll bother you. Okay. Sorry, everybody else. We're going to move on now. We'll talk after class. Okay. <coughs> Somebody who spoke over here? No? Okay. Real quick, parse list. <coughs> Showed you mod the, the module syntax, right? Uh, this scope is, is unique to this module definition. Uh, block scoping with let. Uh, exciting things with weak maps. Exporting uh, the class, of course, you can export any of the identifiers that, that, we, that we declare inside the module. Um, and arrow functions with exciting implicit tail returns. Now, of course, you can also do arrow functions that have uh, curly braced bodies with return statements that go multiple lines if you have many things you want to do. And they will still have that lambda behavior <coughs> where their scope is inherited from the enclosing scope within which they're defined. Uh, that behavior stands true in, in any of the syntactic forms of error functions. Are there any questions specific to these that aren't that much? <laughs> no? You guys want some more stuff? When you say tail returns, are you talking about Terraform recursion? Uh, no, so there is an entire, uh, uh, so, so the question is, he asked, when I say tail returns, does he mean, uh, uh, you say, say again, uh, tail recursion? Right, so currently there is, uh, uh, basically tail calls are being reformed in the spec, how the algorithms are handled. That's actually being handled in a completely separate uh, um, part of the spec at a much lower level, so that uh, tail call recursion will be. Uh, so basically, you won't like blow the stack. Uh, right. But it's a breaking change, so it's it's very delicate, right? I, what I, what the answer to the question I think you're asking is that you don't need to use an explicit return statement. The last expression in the oh. function is the return value of the function. Like, oh, like okay. in copy okay. scripts are much simpler than, than I than I thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So yes. So yeah. by, by by implicit tail return, what I meant is this expression is evaluated, right? And whatever its value is, that's the return value. Without me explicitly saying return uh, b plus zero, yeah. right? Sorry. I told you. Wait. So that means that if there was a bunch of semicolon things, it would only be the last one. That's Correct. After the, right. all that. but no, that, no, that would throw you. Would, if you you can't do more than once one expression uh, there, you would have to go. You'd have to put a body. You'd have to use the the curlies and, and have a body. So you could just with the arrow function, you could just do a body. You could yes. All right. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. With JS lint. <laughs> Why you he has no idea what any of this is. <laughs> <Why you're laughs> <not here. laughs> Assuming JS Lint exists five years in the future, will they want you to use curly braces to do it? That's a really good question. I have no idea. Channel crack. <laughs> I think it would be one of those things where it would come out where people start making a bunch of errors in their programs and it's very common and that this type of syntax allude, like allows people to easily make errors they didn't intend to, then they would probably be we're really a just channel crap. <laughs> so, so that, I mean, that is the motivation. <laughs> that is that's exactly it. Uh, so I guess it's a question of if nobody fucks it up, it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Will that be the case? I don't know. I'll ask my crystal ball. Just kidding. I don't know. So the other parts so far have been like multi-slide thing. I'm going to cram up a couple of smaller examples into single slides. So, remember I showed you the import destructuring, right? Where we did the import, the identifier from the module. Well, I wanted you to see a little bit more destructuring. So, you guys are familiar, I'm, I'm sure you probably do this with like, uh, backbone. You ever done the thing where you, like, I don't want to have to type backbone.model, so I just uh, alias it to model or something like at the top of, of your definition, your module definition, <coughs> nobody else does that? 
I hate typing and stuff, so I, I try to shorten it up as early as possible. Well, so with destructuring, you can take any object and, and pull off uh, properties by name, right? In two convenient little forms, such as this. So if I want to grab parse and stringify off JSON, I can just boom, bang, just done like that. One line, awesome, done, great. Moving on, right? You can also do this with arrays. You can do array destruction. I don't have any examples, sorry. It's very similar though, right? Easy. It's a small thing that you just like, shit, this makes my life so much easier. Imagine if you had like, uh, uh, I don't know, the Canvas API. Hold up, let's kill. Set, but I see all this extra junk in here that 
isn't allowed and I get rid of it. So now you have a unique set. So because the sets are in implement iterator protocol, bam, we're going to spread it out into an array. Unique array in three lines. Yes! <laughs> Take that! I think I got that out of uh, maybe underscore or something? No, I think I made that one. Um, right? But how much nicer is that? Like I, ne like, I don't need like library code for these things anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like, remember the extend slide from the earlier? How many times have you ever included underscore in a project just to use extend? <laughs> Be honest. Right? Be honest. No, don't lie. You're all lying. <laughs> Can't even look yourself in the face. Right? Imagine not having to do that. Kill it. No script tags at all. I don't need them because, remember, we could just write a three-liner in our own code that does our own extending. Or if we only have a single target source, we could just use that object assign straight. Right? No more library code. This is this is the idea, right? What are you doing to me? <laughs> I'll get done when I get done. <laughs> so earlier I was telling you about shorthands. What? <laughs> is there a benefit to spreading over doing a new of the constructor in a way? I don't know. Because you, you're using the constructor of one class to oh. do some algorithmic work for you, and then you're so doing the a syntactic is, element. So the spread is just sugar for really? constructing that array, right? And it just, it, it also, it allows you to, like the spread operator itself can, can be overloaded, or will be overloaded to accept any kinds of prisons. Like, so Ben actually made an interesting discovery recently uh, using the array constructor. <coughs> it's like, if you do array apply, right? Is it array apply null and then? Yeah, you can actually use the array constructor apply invitation with it and pass it a uh, sparse array as the array to be applied. And it will actually return a non-sparse array from that. And you can actually give it an object, just a length of five. As, so you're using like capital A array dot apply null comma object of length of five and it will return an array with a length of five, a non-sparse array, so undefined is all the values of that. So you can actually so, use apply invocation with constructor function like that. What did that have anything to do with what we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it was cool, and I was near Ben, and I remember that. Well, it's another instance of using the constructor to do something. Right. So, and, and there are actually two new array constructors that I co-authored with Dave Herman from Mozilla that aren't even in, I don't think they're in. Like they're not currently my favorite things. I like them, but they're they're a shimmable version of the spread and rest uh, array from is like spread and array of is like rest where I can just pass it and it doesn't break on a single numeric uh, argument and give you like a weird you know set of uh, array full of holes and a length. It just gives you a single element array. This is not my favorite thing. <coughs> That's why it's not in the in in, in, uh, in the presentation. But anyway, so. What are the benefits of using this? That the spread accepts pretty much everything the way it's specified. Uh, what's exciting is the is the iterable uh, acceptance, whereas that it'll turn anything that Im implements an iterator protocol, it will turn that into an array, right? That's exciting. So that's that's why it will turn that set, which is not an array. I mean, internally, its data structure looks like an array, but it's not an array. It's got a lot of extra special goodness going on, like the automatic uniqueness, right? Being able to turn that into an array for uh, uh, serialization, right? That's powerful, right? Because then I can actually take that serialized uh, array and uh, revive it at some point later and turn it back into the set if I need to. Whoever's doing experimentation, try that out. Tell me how it works. So, Property initialization. Uh, this is all on one thing, so you've probably already looked ahead. But uh, so Ben and I did did some renaming of properties uh, in in some jQuery core code, and will probably end up being uh, a pull request. But so this is actually from jQuery core. This is where the AJAX get post shorthands are defined. It just does this loop, right? And it does some uh, parameter hockey, and then it really just maps to jQuery AJAX. But do you notice 
that it does this insane shit where it just says URL, URL. Type, type, <laughs> type, data type, data, data, set, set. Show of hands, how many times have you had to do that in the last month? I only have two hands. <laughs> no, like, insane in the membrane. It's so, so incredibly, like, it, it, it totally, can, like, why should I have to do that? Like, obviously, I'm just passing along, but I, I, I want to use, you know, a, a, a plain object to test this, because I have all these extra parameters, but man, this really sucks. What if I could just do that instead? And have the identifiers be automatically transformed into property names with the <coughs> values of that identifier. Right. What? That is the same thing as that. Do I need to <coughs> bump this up in size so you get the same? Because I didn't even hear. Uh, I, why isn't there a round of applause for the <laughs> And, and it gets the point across. It's like, oh, cool, I'm sending an object with these properties that are going to have the values that we know we got from this argument. And <coughs> yes? those, those, uh, those names have to be identifiers. It can't be just like expressions. Like, uh, Correct. They have to, yeah, that would probably be that would correct. And that also requires grammar changes. Yes. Yes. Um, but, yes? Can you mix the styles? I'm sorry? Can you mix the styles? Like, list it straight down? If you want to have success, not if you don't have a variable called success to pass in under the success identifier, but you have variables for the rest of it, yeah, like do you have to assign a variable called success in line four? Can you just say success colon the value? Oh, uh, oh, you know, I have no idea, but you should be able to. I didn't try it. It shouldn't make a difference. You should be able the comma, the commas in grammatically, yeah. the commas separate each entity should be enough to allow that to happen. Uh, somebody feel like experimenting? <laughs> you, on you right there. Um, that's pretty awesome, right? It's a simple thing. It's small, but you can you can say like that is gonna save me so much headache. And I argue that reading this is way easier than reading this. Like it's way clearer what's going on here than what's going on there. That's exciting to me. Like if this means that I can understand that oh you're calling <clears throat> jQuery Ajax with this list of parameters. It actually just looks like in our arguments list. Ooh, great. The one problem I could see is people thinking of it, looking at that and thinking, oh, it's an array, like being used to how they're constructing a little bit wrong. <laughs> 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 it totally but, works. Uh, Did you hear that? You can, oh mixing God. works. You, oh, okay. you have a phone over here. I'm not here. So, so we mix the URL and the next equals five. Open up to the JS console. That's also fun. Because right. everything that executes here is global. So you can uh -huh. you can play with the direct in the console. Oh, no way. Is that syntax related to the import syntax? No. <laughs> it's just that inside of curly braces is this whole other world of grammar that hasn't been tainted <laughs> by everything outside. <laughs> so uh, Alan Worf's Brock uh, basically has this like long laundry list of exciting um, <laughs> syntax that he knows is possible. So when he finds things that aren't the triangle operator, uh, we're like, yes, this is exciting. Let's do that. Um, because you can, because in, you can have like these subproductions, right? Uh, like that are, are basically like, oh, within the curly braces, this is how we parse, right? So we have a common group. So it's totally unrelated, but still, you can you can imagine like the trouble you can get into by having this whole new uh, clean slate area of <laughs> syntax that you can implement just inside the curly braces. Um, I swear I saw a hand out of the corner of my eye. Maybe I imagined that. Nope. I bet you have to have good test covers, though, if you <laughs> decide to remain one of those things. That oh, well, yeah, I mean, but you're, you're writing tests kind of all kind of for all of your chaos. JavaScript anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's not a problem. Change the API, maybe update the tests, you're good to go. Because you'll, you'll see when your test fails. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So tomorrow I have to start all over and relearn everything I thought I had. Can you can you back up and tell us like this stuff is great, like it's all brand new. Is this all proposed or is this available? Everything I've showed you is proposed, accepted, and in the ES6 draft. Availability 
Not so much. You have, uh, so in my preparation guide that I sent out earlier today, the instructions were like, use Chrome Canary, which is, you know, the Edge Chrome, right? Go to Chrome Flags, enable experimental JavaScript. This is behind a flag, right? And then, then even then, to use the syntax, you have to use uh, the tracer browser REPL that's also linked to in there. Uh, some of the stuff is, in fact, available in Firefox. But let's be perfectly honest, uh, you're not going to be using this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis for another three to four years. I mean, most likely you'll probably end up being able to use it in Node because yes. you don't have to worry about multiple browsers. And right. That was my next question, which I thought was too, new, too much of a new question. Was how much of this stuff is in Node, or is that a completely different process? Check this out. Run programs, Node dash dash harmony, and you'll get you get modules, weak maps, sets, maps. Uh, a whole and lets uh, you get yeah block scope with let const etc. Um, is there a version no specific for that to work? Or is it no? But you're using the latest stable release of no, right? <laughs> it's not a 1.0 yet, right? Uh, I believe so. Every time they upgrade V8, whatever's been implemented behind those that harmony option flag, be, like. It's you know it's progressive. So whatever the V8 team is implementing and has behind Harmony flag, Node will have behind that Harmony flag. So if you follow, uh, I don't recommend doing this, but if you really want a full inbox, uh, subscribe to V8 Dev and V8 User mailing list. It's the same, but you'll know everything about V8 all the time. If you want to actually do that crap. Now, um, a lot of this. I feel like is encapsulated in low dash or underscore that, that we would use anyway, especially with compatibility reasons for future purposes. Maybe what what it just all, all the conversation we've had tonight would not be available to us by one of those other libraries. It's cool. It's part of ES6. Rephrase that. I'm not sure I follow. So I trust that it's not possible to point low dash. So that's not entirely. I, I'll, I'd like to ask you to look at it in from, a, di from a different angle. I'd like you to look at it from what things were so common that libraries had to redo them and redo them and redo them. Like, if you follow NPM Twitter account, like I do, I seriously want to vomit the amount of class implementation sugar libraries that people like check into NPM, it's obvious to me that people want encapsulated class, right? So think about it in terms of these are things that, yeah, you can do almost this thing that you want to do today, right? By some kind of insane means, you know, like wrapped up in some sort of API sugar. But to give it to you in syntax, you cannot do syntax with libraries. Lodash is API, right? Oh, argument signatures is not syntax. You, a lot of people, you know, particularly you, I, you hear this a lot with JavaScript developers. And I apologize. I'm not trying to offend everybody. I want as well. People say syntax a lot. Like, oh, I really like the jQuery syntax. No, you don't. There's no such thing. You like the jQuery API, right? You like the jQuery argument signatures. It's all API. It's not syntax. What you can't do. In, in, in syntax is for the language to try to do for you. So locate the, the cow paths, or I like to use the term cow highways, uh, because like, for example, extend, you know, having something that's built in a language for extend, yeah, you could do that in a library, and it doesn't even cost syntax, but a library can't optimize the way the, the runtime can, right? Runtime in a browser or in Node can optimize that in ways that no library could ever even imagine. So get it into the language, right? So think about it in terms of what is the most common hardship of mine? <coughs> That's what's, what the goal is to fix those hardships, or to ease those hardships, not to try to like give you something that you can or can't do, uh, just to make them better for you. Is that good? Yeah, that's, that's how I feel. And that's 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 the general goal of, 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 of the, the entire committee. That's everybody's overarching plot is, is to make these things easier to do and, and more pleasant and more optimizable, more secure, and so forth. There's so many hands, and I'm really sorry. What's going on? What do you think of TypeScript? 
I think TypeScript's awesome. Uh, friends with Luke Hogan, I got uh, an early preview of it uh, before it was launched. TypeScript is just a developer tool, and it's all ES6 code. So uh, you could actually add it to that experiment uh, list that I gave. Get TypeScript from NPM and write TypeScript programs and check out the, the output. It's awesome. You can do all this stuff in Node using TypeScript today. And I actually feel bad that I didn't include it on the list. Um, but yeah, and, the, and the types aren't explicitly enforced. It's mainly just the documentation. Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually that's a really good point. TypeScript doesn't it, it isn't like uh, types types types. It actually takes out all the type checking in in the transpiled output. It's literally a developer tool. It's just to keep your team do like writing good code, you know, and and not like you know like falling into the same sort of uh, bad practice. Patterns. It just enforces a few small and smart uh, uh, type checks just in the source, and then compiles to write a little structure. Does that get people to think that maybe there's some danger there if, if TypeScript goes one way and ES6 goes another way? Well, the guys that are heading that team, uh, specifically uh, Luke Hogan, who is the lead developer, not the guy, he did not write TypeScript. But he, like, he's not like the creator. He's like basically like the lead lieutenant enforcer, if you will, uh, and 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 one of the co-designers. He's actually uh, a committee member along with Eric. And I. So like he and he's he's a very details guy, right? So he does not want TypeScript to veer. The only thing it's veering on is the, is including types, which it is completely separated. TypeScript can actually have the types pulled out uh, in the way they. Which is really awesome because then you could, I mean, if you wanted to hack that the TypeScript uh, compiler yourself, you could pull all of that out. It's just layer one. Right? That's pretty easy. Um, I got only a few slides left, but uh, any questions? No? Okay, hold on. So, uh, yeah, is, is there any um, potential future where uh, optional simple types get added to XSCript? <coughs> I don't know. This, this is this is this is an interesting question. The, the thing is, is that nobody has, uh, sorry, uh, a future where uh, possibly optional types uh, find their way in language. It's possible. There's proposals for guards, uh, traits, um, modules are actually uh, module bodies because of of the, they they have their own global record. They're actually you can statically. So you can actually include like you do macros and stuff, modules for building in your own type systems. So these things become possible after ES6 and more feasible after CS ES6 and even more so not bound to the language, but possibly <coughs> just bound to your application, right? So if you're in the future, if you wanted to write like so, say ES7 actually, you know. Uh, you know, reifies a, a macro system, right? Your app could have its own type checking system built on these, on this macro from a model. Why not? So you could have optional well, types. You could have something universal so that code can be shared among everybody and talent, you know, skills can be shared. Right. Well, I, I mean, it makes it more readable. But the thing is, is the the, 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 gen the general the general like uh, motivation is is what is the what is the community doing? What does the community as a whole, how can it benefit? So when the committee looks at those kinds of things, so let's just say in this uh, hypothetical future that we're talking about that, that a, an optional type system emerges from these macros because modules made static compilation possible, right, 10 years from now or something. Maybe not so long. Uh, the cycles are much faster for, for specification yeah. uh, publication. But you could just imagine this being then a, a sooner possibility once you get past uh, the initial uh, allowing of, of, of new uh, syntactic forms and language, which come as ES6, sort of like an opening flow. But to answer your question more directly, no. There is currently no plan and no harmonized proposal for any kind of option. <coughs> Feel free to write it, It's And I'm not even kidding. Like that uh, posted to the mailing list if you feel as though you have a, a, like a solid idea. I'm sure 
a white ship will be argued. <laughs> so, I had jumped ahead and you probably all pretty much understand this, right? <laughs> you know what's yeah. going on now. I just wanted to show you uh, very specifically uh, concise methods on their own, but you guys have already got this down, right? I just don't have to write function anymore. How nice is that? Isn't that nice? This gets the point across very easily. So we know that we can visually parse that things that have this parentheses and then the curly brace body, that's a function. So I don't need to write function. Right. We can get away with it because, as we were talking about before, we have all kinds of leeway inside inside the curly brace bodies that hasn't yet been completely polluted, but let's pull the shit out of it, why not? But <laughs> we'll make good decisions, right? I, I think that's a good decision. Uh, but th this is just a very simple example. So, yeah. Yep. So those come through as name functions, or are they still allowed to be questions? Exciting, exciting <laughs> question. Do those come through as name functions? Brandon Benby, who is the creator of Continuum, which is on your preparation sheet page that, that I put together, Continuum is a complete ES6 VM that Brandon wrote himself from scratch. It's insane in the motherfucking memory. If you use Continuum, it is actually the whole of the ES6 specification in its current form, the like the draft from beginning to end. It's amazing. And he uh, came up with, in, in the process of doing so, he actually was able to come up with a, uh, a, a redefined proposal for better name, uh, for deriving the, 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 the name of a function, whether it be a, uh, you know, a declaration or an expression, uh, with you know anonymous uh, function expression or whatever you want to call it, right? That actually works and totally isn't bored to like all previous proposals, and it's on the agenda for next week. Marita. Yeah, it's and it, like I've read through it a couple of times, and it actually works really well. Uh, and it's just super simple token parsing uh, during like bit, during the uh, the parsing phase. That's it. And it annotates, and then when you get the AST, you have it's like ah, I know what the name is. Boaz is trying to tell me to move on. Sorry, blame him. Uh, so I already showed you a thing earlier, but I wanted to. This is actually the last series of the slides. It's going to be a couple of them because it's a whole set of stuff. So when you work with a DOM and you have event listeners, you end up wanting to do things like add an event listener to something you've just created. And you're like, oh, but I, you know, the video elements have play and pause buttons. So when you click on my custom play and pause button, uh, I want the thing to play and pause. Does anybody see anything wrong with this? I think that looks great. I'm going to commit this. You want to code review this for me? Yes. <coughs> Your this is not going to be the one you thought it was going to be. Absolutely not going to be the one I thought it was going to be. Because it's going to be <coughs> current target, right? Inside of DOM event handlers, you get current target as this. Which sucks because this is my constructor. I made this, not somebody else. And it, that's a weird thing to have happen. So I have some solutions, or there are some solutions. We can alias this here, and create a reference, and then boom, that'll work. That's awesome. But now I've got this closed over copy of that. Also, self is a host object. Uh, in work web workers, right? I, I don't think that that's in, that is the case in browsers. No. And it's not a specif, it's not in the specification. That's not like a language thing. That's like it's self. Like is, thing? Yeah, self is used by web workers in the DOM. And it might also be in window as well. Yeah, window not so. Yeah. It's it's it, it, right, but anyway, pattern remains. You can easily change this to here. Will this make you feel better? It's fine. Okay. No, no. no. <laughs> Selfie. You've done this before, right? <laughs> that great job. Cool. <laughs> Still, uh, but the thing is, is so we, we were also now closing over a, a, a second reference, which is unfortunate. Um, another option in ES5, we could bind this. Is anybody, is anybody familiar with bind? Function prototype bind? It's like call and apply, but doesn't immediately invoke the way those do. Awesome. Well, it allows you to set the, the scope of, of the, the function. Awesome. Except that its implementation itself creates a function 
in eternally, that it then returns with the, that scope back to it. It's kind of, uh, it's like the nastiest band-aid that has ever been band-aided in the history of band-aiding. <laughs> it's gross. It's got like scab on it and it's hair and pulled off. And like, oh, nothing healed. They just moved it to the end. Oh, God. But he gets the job done. Um, oops. Take it out. I, on the other hand, would much prefer to write what I mean. And write what I mean in the future is uh, to use an arrow function that just inherits the enclosing scope. So it says, oh, well, this is a constructor. And I have, it has its own scope, which is this. So when I use the arrow function, this inside there is what I want it to be. Because I've written what I mean. So here's an example of where, where I've used the body, right? And I've omitted the parens because it's just a single, uh, a, a single argument being passed. It's unnecessary to have all the parens in the parens. <coughs> Syntactically, you need them if you have more than one because you can't have separated list because then where does where does add event listeners uh, parameter list start and end, right? In this case, we this can be parsed copy acceptably to allow us the convenience of fitting these parents and having a slight short answer. It's a little bit of a trade-off, but semantically it does now what I want without creating the bind in, without having an alias at the top that then closes over yet another reference inside my constructor to the exact same object. Yes, Ben? So, the Thanos, it'd be fair to say that the Thanos syntax in addition to having the sugar around like an optional function body, not requiring a return, if you want to return the value of the last expression, it also like lexically inherits this. That is, in fact, the most important thing that it does is that it lexically inherits this. Can bind or color or pattern be used to change to this value inside of the tag? Cannot. So it's effectively like bind. It is. It is like bind that does not leave a function. Like <coughs> right, right. It's right. a more efficient thing. It's, a, it's, the, it's the supercharged <coughs> version of bind. Yes. yes. Is there any plan for a skinny arrow that does not lexically inherit? Why would you need the skinny arrow when you have concise methods? You sold us on that type of function. Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't have to the name. Don't require you typing in the function. I don't have to name it though. It's just an anonymous function. Find me a use case that a concise method or fatter <coughs> fails on. I, I, an anonymous function that does not want to lexically inherit this. Then that that's like the one last use case. <laughs> <laughs> totally aware, but like, let, let's, we're not saying that you can't use regular old function expression. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is if you spend, well, I'm not, okay, first of all, let me make perfectly clear. I also would like a skinny arrow. Okay? Right. Let's just get that out there. <laughs> I think a skinny arrow would in fact be nice. Several other members of the committee would also like a skinny arrow. It is up to viewers like you. <laughs> and the, the oh man, there was a joke about, there, there, listen, I had a joke about donating money to public radio in there somehow. But anyway, <laughs> um, if you are uh, to, if you come up with a thoughtful argument and proposal and uh, rationale for why you also believe that arrow, uh, skinny arrow would be beneficial, I would. I would love it, and I would be inspired if you posted that to the ES Discuss mailing list. Right. Uh, don't be afraid. It's not right. like an they're, they're not mean. They're just frank. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, so, so the answer to your question is, the more people that express a desire for it, the more likely you are to uh, sway the yeah, interest of it. It affects the media. Absolutely, absolutely. Basically, if you can get Brendan to love it, and he already, I think, secretly wants skinny arrows and wants the rest of the committee in on it, and I, I think most of the web guys, I think we're all kind of on the same. Like, I'm not against it, I do want them, but I certainly wouldn't be opposed to them. But, you know, so I uh, would love it if you post it to the mailing list. I will back you up. All right. I will say, yes, I also agree with what this gentleman has said. Um, so 
Remember the time that I told you this was going to end abruptly? It's now ended. <laughs> now I don't feel so bad. Uh, subscribe to these to this mailing list if you want to know absolutely every single possible thing about the future <laughs> of JavaScript. Um, try not to create a filter to send it to your trash. Uh, try not to create a filter to automatically archive it. Um, <coughs> try to read all of the messages, or some of the messages, or any of them that you see even seem interesting to you. Uh, that's, that's how I got involved, and that's how you also can get involved. Um, Dominic Denicola, who is not a member of TC39, but is uh, just a, a community member um, who is also interested and is on the mailing list, created this Twitter account that I think you should all follow that does convenient uh, summaries in 140 characters of, of uh, threads on the mailing list. So like, really boils it right down as far as possible, but with a link to the discussion so you can read through the whole thing if you'd like to. Um, follow them or also subscribe. And that concludes my presentation. Round of applause.